chapter 4. Uh, chapter 4 is very similar to chapter 4 in the Gilovich text. So most of the material we're going to cover today is in the Gilovich text. Uh, the t title of uh, chapter 4 is Social Perception, How We Come to Understand Other People. Obviously, it has something to do with their socks. The strange part is that all those guys have on the same shoes. It's a little weird. Anyway, that's how we identify people by their socks. Just kidding. Cultures around the world are different because of the need to adapt differently to different environments. However, there are some norms that cultures uh, universally maintain. One of those taboo, one is the incest taboo. Uh, incest taboo is um, universally condemned uh, except in select uh, royal families. Uh, the royal family of Egypt could only marry uh, within their own family. The uh, royal families of Europe, uh, th there was no taboo on uh, marrying first cousins. Uh, one of the reasons for uh, the clan structure of uh, the, the uh, uh, Diné people is uh, to prevent uh, incest the concept of incest. There's uh, also universal, culturally universal, is uh, some form of friendship. Um, this includes respect the friend's privacy, make eye contact while talking, and uh, not divulging uh, things said in confidence. Another uh, cultural universal is that, that people of higher status are talked to using formal talk, while those of lower status are spoken to familiarly. This is really kind of interesting. When I was uh, in college, uh, one of my good friends was from uh, Greece. And uh, at the time, uh, Greece was going through a um, upheaval, uh, and uh, he was called back to go to, uh, to, to join the military. He was called back to Greece. And he refused to do it, and he kept writing them letters. He kept <laughs> evidently in Greece they have three languages. They have the ancient language, of course. They have formal language, and then they have a uh, a common language. And he was writing them letters in the common language, and he got in, that's how he got in trouble. That's why they called him back because he wasn't writing in the formal uh, the formal form. It's really kind of fascinating. He didn't go back. Uh, someone else took over in the, gov the, the government, uh, luckily for him, it wasn't uh, the people that demanded that he come back, and uh, today he's in charge of uh, security in, uh, in Greece. I read his, uh, a book that he wrote <laughs> in graduate school, um, Yanis Petros Rubatis is the man's name, uh, really fascinating guy. I was able to, uh, to see pictures of him on the internet because he's relatively famous, I guess, especially in Greece. Yanis Petros Robot, he's a little bitty guy. He called me, uh, he used to call me the Hoosier farm boy. <laughs> uh, trying to make fun of me, I guess, but I didn't take it as an insult. I guess I'm not very good at taking insults. Language is a strong uh, social identifier. Uh, higher status people are spoken to in a formal manner. And they will speak back uh, to a subordinate in a more familiar manner, using their first names, for example. In most languages, there are two forms of the word you, uh, one that is formal and one used with friends and intimates, and that's the way it is in French, in Latin, and in, uh, in Spanish as well. Uh, in uh, most circumstances, it is for the higher status person to suggest familiarity with the lower status person. I'm sure you've heard that 80% of communication is nonverbal. Uh, you read people, uh, and I just noticed that I do this all the time. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm, not, I'm, I'm pretty good at it. This is why someone with uh, autism spectrum disorder has a problem communicating. They must be taught to attend to people when they are trying to communicate in order to understand the person better. People lower on the autism spectrum, what used to be called Asperger's syndrome, can learn to attend to people easier, and for that reason they, are often, they often seem like they have no problems, but the reality is they, it's still there. 
Nonverbal cues serve a variety of functions. So they help us express our emotions. They help us to express our attitudes. They help us to express our personality. They cue us as to the emotions of others. They cue us as to the attitudes of others. They cue us as to the personality of others. The idea that humans communicate through facial expressions goes back to Charles Darwin's The Expressions of the Emotions in Man and Animals that he wrote in 1970 or 1872. <laughs> Sorry, I put him in the wrong century. Darwin's idea was that uh, primary facial expressions are universal. All humans encode their emotions onto their faces in the form of expressions. All humans can therefore interpret or decode the expressions accurately, unless someone is suffering from autism spectrum disorder. Darwin felt that facial expressions are so expressive because they were necessary ways of communicating before the strength of language. Early hominids uh, would have a, make a bad face when they tasted something terrible, and that would warn all the other hominids to stay away from this food. And of course, as we can see, see this little girl does not like lima beans. <laughs> okay, six major expressions. The one on the left is disgust. The one on the right is happy. The one on the left is scared. The one on the right is surprised. The one on the left is sad. And the one on the right is angry. Those are the six major expressions. Angry, sad, surprised, scared, happy, and disgusted. These are universal as far as people go. There are some other emotions that uh, there is a question as to whether they are, uh, are universal or not. The one on the left is contempt. The one on the right is anxiety. The one on the left is shame. The one on the right is determination. The one on the left Oh, sorry, the one on the right is embarrassment. The one on the left is envy. And there is a question as to whether those are universal or not. The one on the left is pride, and the one on the right is not, uh, not impressed. It's Michelle Obama not being impressed with something at the, at the 2012 Olympics. Decoding facial expressions tends to be complicated when the individual is experiencing more than one emotion and uh, all are registered on the face. This is known as uh, affect blending. Affect blending. A facial expression may be ambiguous and interpretation depends on context and cues. Culture may dictate how a facial expression is interpreted. Now you have to remember that before talkies, uh, they were making movies, uh, that silent films, and they were using very expressive faces, and people were able to uh, decode those faces, uh, and, and millions of people went to see these movies despite the fact they had no words. Each culture will maintain their own display rules for facial expressions and nonverbal communication. U.S. cultural norms discourage emotional displays in men. In Japan, women are discouraged from showing strong emotion and, in fact, will cover their mouths if any emotion is evident. And if you've ever been to Japan or been around people that are from Japan, they cover their mouth a lot, especially women. Uh, well, men don't cover their mouths. They don't. They're just like in the United States. They don't, they don't display emotion. But uh, Japanese women, of course, will cover their mouths. That and the fact they don't like their teeth. Uh, they, um, they tend to have small teeth and, or small mouths, and it kind of jams their teeth together. In the United States, the dominant culture admires direct eye contact and equates it with honesty. But in many native cultures and around the world, it is considered rude. And this is true in Nigeria, 
in Puerto Rico, in Thailand, and Japan. In Arab countries, their direct eye contact tends to be quite intense. As a matter of fact, by U.S. standards, it is considered piercing or rude. And if you've ever been around someone from the Arab countries, you'll <laughs> you probably experience this. I used to play soccer in California. When I was in California, I played soccer. And I played soccer with some gentlemen from Saudi Arabia. And it was... I, I was afraid they were angry with me all the time, but that wasn't wasn't really what was going on. They were they were just being themselves and staring. One aspect of nonverbal communication that doesn't register with most people is personal space. Some countries demand a great deal of personal space and others little. The English maintain the most personal space, North Americans, North Northern Europeans. Asians, Pakistanis, most Native American groups maintain the most uh, personal space. Um, kind of an interesting story. The uh, when I first arrived at Diné College, the uh, uh, person that was in charge of the psychology program was Canadian. She was a uh, Canadian, and I'm from Indiana. <laughs> and uh, it was really kind of interesting because we would kind of yell at each other. Uh, because we we our personal spaces were were so uh, extensive that uh, that we didn't actually ever get very close to each other, not close enough to reach out and touch each other. So uh, when we had conversations that was from you know five six feet apart, a little bit weird, just a little bit strange. <clears throat> Other countries uh, have far less personal space when they converse and, and want to be close enough to touch the other person. Uh, France, Southern Europe, middle, the Middle East, and South America, uh, you'll see people standing right on top of each other um, and, and trying to converse with and conversing with one another. It seems a little close to me because I'm from Indiana, of course, but uh, uh, it's, it's kind of interesting when you're in France and somebody comes up and they start talking to you. It's like they get in your face. Or if you've ever been around Italians or around somebody who's Greek, um, they uh, they they tend to get right up into your into your face when you're they're having conversations. Um, it's a little well, it can be off putting. It's you just have to get used to it. It's really kind of interesting. In the United States and much of the world, uh, flashing two fingers is a symbol of peace, victory, or two. In the rest of the English-speaking world, if you make that gesture with your palm toward you, it means the same as the middle finger gesture. Actually, it means up yours is what it's supposed to mean. <clears throat> In the United States, any way that you do it is, is considered okay. Thumbs up has only positive connotations in much of the world, but in the Middle East, Italy, and Greece, it means up yours and is quite undesirable. In the United States, making a circle with your index finger and thumb means A-OK, -okay, but in France, Venezuela, Turkey, and Brazil, it means zero or worthless. In Japan, it is a symbol for money. The summoning gesture in the United States means death in Singapore and Japan, so be careful. The most uh, In most of the world, left-handed people are tolerated for their backward use of hands and no one cares. In the Middle East, India, Sri Lanka, and Africa, the use of the left hand for anything isn't tolerated because, because it's the hand that you wipe yourself with. So people don't want you to use their left use you to use your left hand. Hand gestures that are universally recognized in select cult, uh, select cultures are referred to as emblems. Emblems are not universal, and this can sometimes lead to trouble. In 1992, President George H.W. Bush thought he was flashing the peace sign, but because he was in Australia, it was the equivalent to the finger. He was giving everybody the finger. Whoops. In Norway in 2005, George W. Bush was meeting a crowd of well-wishers when someone in the audience yelled, Texas. The president imme immediately th threw up the hook'em horn sign of the University of Texas Longhorns, Unfortunately, in Norway, the hand gesture is the sign of the devil. So there you go. 
and they knew who he was. Hook 'em horns, you devil. First impressions or the primacy effect can lead such a strong lasting impression that an individual will maintain the impression even in the face of overwhelming conflicting impressions. First impressions become perhaps the most important key in, in, in information integration. It doesn't take much to develop an idea about someone, and that is, difficult, that is difficult to change when someone makes meaningful conclusions about another person's personality based on a brief encounter. It is called thin slicing. Even in the face of new and conflicting information, that should prompt us to reconsider, most people will stick to their initial judgment. And this is known as belief perseverance. Research shows that belief perseverance won't allow jurors to ignore inadmissible evidence. Belief perseverance also explains why scientists have a hard time discounting fabricated published data. People uh, find inconsistent thoughts uncomfortable and unpleasant, thus we go with our initial thoughts and because it and because it takes less effort to believe what you've already been told. We can use first impressions and nonverbal communication to our advantage by public speaking, make sure the opening is strong, job interviews, dress, eye contact, body posture, all affect evaluations, handshake quality affects assessments of personality, and final hiring recommendations. Work done by Carvey, Cuddy, and Yap in 2010 showed that merely by standing in a high-power pose, an individual could raise their testosterone level and feel more confident. And this Carvey is Dana Carvey, the comedian, actually. As weird as that may seem, there should be a comma right there. I apologize. High-power poses, uh, your hands on your hips and your feet spread apart. Uh, standing with your hands open on a table. Low power pose, being closed off in both of those cases. Low power poses, covering your genital areas, uh, being closed off again. Anytime you're closed off, that's a low power pose. That means you're trying to protect yourself from a high power pose whether you're sitting down or standing up, you're trying to protect yourself from those guys. Attribution theory is a theory that tries to explain others' behavior. Attribution tends to be attributed either to external causes or internal causes. For example, researchers have discovered that men are more likely to attribute a woman's friendliness to mild sexual interest. This is known as misattribution. This particular misattribution may be one of the main contributing factors to male behavior that women consider sexual harassment or rape. Males universally tend to be more sexually assertive than women. This may be one reason why 23% of women say that they have been forced into unwanted sex, while only 3% of men admit that they uh, admit to forcing a woman into an unwanted sex act. Unfortunately, the more sexually aggressive a male the more likely he is to misread women's communication. Fritz Heider was a Gestalt psychologist who first proposed the attribution theory in 1958. Heider noted that when someone else does something, gets in front of you in traffic, it is because of, uh, of internal reasons, revenge or evilness. When we do something that could be considered incorrect, we tend to attribute to external causes because we know exactly why we did something. And for some reason, I put a picture of me and my kids. That's my son and my daughter. And this is, uh, was taken in 2002, so that was 22 years ago. My son was 30 at the time, and my daughter was 32. This is in August, on August 14th. And I was teaching at uh, Fort Belknap College, and I had taken, uh, I had, uh, that's my t-shirt from the uh, Chief Joseph Powwow, Chief Joseph Veterans Memorial Powwow Fun Run and Walk. <clears throat> anyway. 
So that's me 20, 22 years ago, 23 years, 21 years ago. I guess I can't do math, can I? And that's my son and my daughter. When deciding about uh, causes of behavior, we can make one of, of two attributions. Internal dispositional attribution, infer a person is behaving in a certain way because of something about the person, for example, their attitude, their character, their personality. That's a disp dispositional attribution. External situational uh, attribution, infer that a person is behaving a certain way because of something about the situation. Assume most people would respond the same way in that situation. And dispositional attribution, she late, turns in her assignment late, so late, you're such a lazy bum. And this one, she turns in her assignment late, and you say, she's so late, maybe it's a family issue. Situational attribution, dispositional attribution. The covariation model is a theory that states that to form an attribution about what caused a person's behavior, we systematically note the pattern between the presence or absence of possible causal factors and whether or not the behavior occurs. So when it's good, it's Mr. Coffee. When it's bad, it's me. <laughs> Kelly assumes that when we are in the process of forming an attribution, we gather information or data. The data we use, according to Kelly, are how a person's behavior co-varies or changes across time, place, different actors, and different targets of the behavior. By discovering co-variation in people's behavior, you are able to reach a judgment about what caused their behavior. The co-variation model focuses on observations of behavior across time, place, actors, and targets. It examines how the perceiver chooses either an internal or an external attribution. We make choices about internal versus external attributions by using three pieces of information. Consensus, the extent to which other peop uh, people behave the same way toward the same stimulus as the actor does. Distinctiveness, the extent uh, to uh, which one particular actor behaves in the same way to different stimuli. Consistency, the extent to which the behavior between one actor and one stimulus is the same across time and circumstances. Internal attribution occurs when consensus is low, behavior is unique to the person, distinctiveness is low, when the person displays the same behavior with different targets and in different situations, and the consistency is high, the person's behavior occurs reliably across occasions. External attribution occurs when consensus is high. Other people behave similarly in the same situation. Distinctiveness is high. The person's behavior is specific to that situation or target. And the consistency is high. The person's behavior occurs reliably, reliably across occasions. And of course, this puppy is so cute that it couldn't possibly have been him. Well, information about all three dimensions may not be available. People will still make attributions. Most frequently, consistency and distinctiveness are used more than consensus. Humans are amazingly adaptive creatures. A small change in a social situation will affect drastically how a person feels and reacts to the social circumstance. The difficulty for social scientists is the gauging which factor is the most important the individual's internal criteria, or the change in social situation. Thus, people assume that what is presented is the legitimate and perpetual feelings of the actor. And this is called the fundamental attribution error. When Sylvia plays paintball, she becomes quite aggressive. Tobin had only seen her at the paintball field, so when he saw her at the grocery with her school friends, he greeted her very loudly and called her Mad Dog. The friends had never seen her playing paintball, so they teased the shy girl mercilessly. Fundamental attribution error. The male ego seems to use the fundamental attribution error often to maintain his ego. Peter Ditto set up an experiment where men met a woman and then the woman rated the men on her impression of them. The men then guessed whether the woman liked them or not. 
when they uh, were told that her negative criticism was part of the experiment, they discontinued what she they discounted what she said. But when they were told that her positive comments were part of the experiment, they didn't believe it. They still thought she was attracted to them. Even when people know different, we assume that other people are the way that they act. And that is part of the fundamental attribution error. When trying to explain our own behavior, we tend to attribute behavior to situations. I was angry because everything was going wrong. When explaining other people's behavior, their behavior is what they are. He is hostile because he is an angry person. Voters come to, to like just elected, uh, just elected candidates. This is the way it used to be anyway. Now, uh, it doesn't seem to be that way. Voters come to like just elected uh, candidates, and this is called the honeymoon period. Contestants value prizes more just after receiving them. People develop an instant liking for those that are they are about to meet. When Germain goes to parties, he is always amazed at how easily everyone melds with each other. He always feels shy and tense. The reality is probably that everyone feels pretty much the same as Germain. Researchers have known for decades that there is a difference between the perspective of being an actor in an event and a, an observer in that event. When we are the actor, the environment around us commands our attention. When we, are, when we watch an event, we watch the actor in the event and the environment becomes less visible. Thus, the person we see as the focus is always the cause, and this is known as perceptual salience. Now, this is really quite important, especially if we're talking about, uh, we're talking about someone that observes a, uh, a crime, an eyewitness. When we are the actor, the environment around us commands our attention. When we watch an event, we watch the actor in the event, and the environment becomes less visible. Perceptual salience. Celeste was working undercover with the meth uh, suppliers in Gallup. Word got back to her that her cover was blown. As she walked past Smokey's Roadhouse on her way to her pickup, she heard a speeding car behind her. She turned and drew her pistol. She caught sight of a man sticking a rifle out the window and fired just as the car swerved into the oncoming traffic. Celeste, working undercover. As Mary pulled out of the gas max across the street from Smokey's, she saw a woman draw a gun, wheel around toward traffic, and fire indiscriminately at the car, trying to get out of the way. The car plowed into oncoming traffic. When questioned on the witness stand, she did not see the rifle or perceive the car as speeding. Now remember, when we are the actor, the environment around us commands our attention. When we watch an event, we watch the actor in the event, and the environment becomes less visible. Perceptual salience. And this is one of the reasons why eyewitness accounts are not always accurate. Mary saw the woman, and that's what she focused on. Celeste saw the oncoming car and uh, saw the rifle poking out the window. And that's what she was focused on. She was focused on the environment. That's, she was trying to save her life. Mary was just focused on Celeste because Celeste had a gun. One of the most persistent fundamental attribution errors around the world is the perception of poverty. People who attribute poverty and unemployment to personal dispositions, they're lazy and undeserving, tend to adopt political positions unsympathetic to such people. People sympathetic to their plight tend to attribute poverty to external attributions. Attribution is usually a two-step process. When something happens to us involving someone else, our first instinct is to detect an internal attribution. This may be an evolutionary reaction to protect us from a possible attacker. Hopefully we are open-minded enough to reevaluate our initial response and possibly adjust our initial reaction. Adjustment, uh, however, requires effort and conscious attention. It doesn't always happen, of course. 
We take personal credit for all of our successes. We blame our failures on someone else, and probably you'll do the same thing for with me. Uh, if, uh, if you have problems with this class, it's probably Bradway's fault. If you do well in this class, Bradway didn't have anything to do with it. <laughs> it's because you're so smart. <laughs> and that's okay, I don't mind. <laughs> I don't mind you guys blaming me for all your failures. One domain in which self-serving biases may be particularly common is the world of sports, especially among solo athletes for whom the entire weight of winning or losing rests on their shoulders. To maintain their own egos, they must find someone else to blame for their failures. One form of defensive attribution is to believe that bad things happen only to bad people, or at least only to people who make stupid mistakes or poor choices. Therefore, bad things won't happen to us because we won't be that stupid or careless. Melvin Lerner called this the belief in a just world, the assumption that people get what they deserve and deserve what they get. And this is, of course, known as the just world phenomenon. There are good things and bad things about just world beliefs. It helps people deal with feelings of vulnerability and mortality, but unfortunately it often leads to blaming the victim. And this is the case with rape victims and battered wives. But anyone who's worked with either rape victims or battered wives know that they are victims and shouldn't be blamed for what happened. When we think of our own attributional biases and other people's biases, we feel we know that other people have more biases than we do. And this is known as bias blind spot. <clears throat> Western culture is holistic and fosters holistic thinking about uh, properties of objects, properties of people, individual autonomy, Judeo-Christian belief in an individual soul. They pay less attention to situation and context. Values in Eastern cultures foster analytic thinking. Eastern thinking focuses on the object or person and the surrounding context and relationships between them. So this is the difference between individualism and collectivism. In individualism, you must think. You must uh, learn to think for yourself. In a collectivist society, you must do what the, is best for everyone around you. While members of individualistic cultures prefer dispositional attributions and think like personality psychologists, members of collectivistic cultures prefer situational explanations and think like social psychologists. Greater situational focus is a matter of degree. Self-serving bias more, is more prevalent in Western individualistic cultures than individualistic collectivist cultures. Explanations of Olympic gold medal success, reporters discuss success in terms of unique talent in the United States, but incorporated role of other people, uh, for example, the coach, the fa your family, uh, in Japan. So in Japan, they, they thank everyone around them. And uh, in the United States, when we talk to somebody who has been successful, uh, it's their efforts. And they don't mention their coach. They don't mention their family. It's all them. Failure make attributions to external causes in the United States, but internal causes in China. Self-critical attributions hold groups together in some Asian cultures. Belief in the just world uh, in the in a just world is more prevalent in cultures with extreme differences in wealth, like in the United States. Something that people have been complaining about lately, and that is the end of chapter four. So next week we tackle chapter five. I'll talk to you next week.